All right, this is a great chapter, Jeremiah chapter 44. There's so much to preach of out of here, but um, I'm not going to do a Bible study just on this one chapter tonight. What I'm going to be preaching on tonight is uh, people who misinterpret the events in their life. There's a lot of people today that, that want to think that God is doing something in their life and they kind of make a, a, a incorrect judgment. They'll see, you know, they do something and then if something good or something bad happens right away, just immediately, they're going to say, oh, God wants me to do this or oh, God doesn't want me to do this. And kind of thinking they're getting this back and forth, like answering with God about things that they really should just be getting their answers from the word of God, not from some mystical things that might be happening or even just day to day things, right? Where you just think, oh, well, God must have just made this happen. You know, because there's a lot, there's a lot of people out there who believe almost a little bit too mystically that, that uh, you know, God talks to you in, in weird ways. Like, I, I, can't, I can't even come up with something right now off the top of my head, but like, you know, people say you, you fried your toaster oven for some reason and you think that's God telling you that, you shouldn't have toast that day or so I don't know some, something kind of really, you know, just some some random things just just regular life you know situations happen and people are always looking for signs and oh what, what is God telling me here or what's God telling me there a lot of times the people who are looking for those things are rarely getting their their nose in this book and looking to see what God actually did say and, and is recorded for us today and you know that it ties in perfect with the sermon this morning this morning's sermon was about you know have you not read and it's all about making sure that you are reading your Bible that you are getting in there daily it's so important that you know God's words and that what he has said for you and um, I think this is a great story to illustrate one of the points that I'm trying to make tonight in this sermon is in Jeremiah chapter 44. Now, in, in you know the context of this, the whole book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah was preaching to the to the people about the the coming captivity from Babylon. He was preaching to the children of Israel and he's preaching unto them and warning them and it's kind of a real negative book and just just all about God's judgment is coming and they need to get right with God and all this other stuff and it continues from him warning about it until the captivity actually coming. And now at this point, there was still a remnant of people left behind. After Babylon came, they conquered, and they took most of the people out of the land. There were some people still left there to kind of keep things going, to be vine dressers, to, to, to be tending to the, to the fields and, and you know, kind of keeping things in order. And Jeremiah was there, and there was a group of people then that, that kind of rebelled and they decided to go into Egypt for protection. And this is sort of where we're at here. That's why we see the references to Egypt. Uh, just to give you a backdrop for the story. And what's happening here is that the people were making offerings and sacrifices unto the Queen of Heaven. Right? Just some false goddess. Some completely false god, some idol that they had set up. And one of the things that's interesting here too is that it seems like the women were very heavily involved in this worship and the men were kind of just standing back and letting it happen. And, and we kind of gather that from the story. But let's look here at verse number 15. We're going to reread some of this even though we read the entire chapter. I want you to get an idea here of what's going on. Verse number 15 reads, Then all the men which knew that their wives had burned incense unto other gods, and all the women that stood by a great multitude, even all the people that dwelt in the land of Egypt and Pathros, answered Jeremiah, saying, So up to this point, as we read in the, in the beginning of the, of the service, Jeremiah's kind of preaching hard against them. And, and, he, and he's warning them and, and, and letting them know, Hey, thus saith the Lord. You know, he doesn't like what you're doing here. You need to repent, basically. You know, it's kind of a paraphrase. So then they hear all this, but they're not willing to change. They're saying, no, we're going to keep doing what we're doing. You know, and the men heard this. It says that, that they knew that their wives had already gone and burned incense on other people, which is obviously um, uh, disobeying God's commandments. And then in verse number 16, they say, As for the word that thou hast spoken unto us in the name of the Lord, we will not hearken unto me. So we're not going to listen unto you. But we will certainly do whatsoever thing goeth forth out of our own mouth, to burn incense unto the Queen of Heaven, and to pour out drink offerings unto her, as we have done, we and our fathers, our kings, and our princes in the cities of Judah, and in the streets of Jerusalem. Look at this. For then had we plenty of victuals and were well, and saw no evil. They're judging on why they're going to do this. Why are we going to go and, and offer up 
do you know, these sacrifices and burn incense under the queen of heaven and do all this stuff. He says, because then when we were doing this before, we had plenty of vittles. Vittles is just like their food. It's their, it's their, uh, it's their um, nourishment. It's, it's their supply. They said there was no famines. We were doing just fine. We had plenty of vittles. We were well. There was no problems. There was no disease. And we saw no evil. You know, everything was just fine when we were doing all of these things. Verse 18 says, but since we left off to burn incense to the queen of heaven, when we stopped doing that, and to pour out drink offerings unto her, we have wanted all things, which means they were lacking in all things, and have been consumed by the sword and by the famine. So here's the people that's looking at their situation. They said, well, we had it really good when we were burning incense under the queen of heaven. Now everything is really bad and we're not doing this anymore. So we're going to go back and Worship the queen of heaven and, and, and get things back the way they were. They were judging what's right just based on their immediate circumstances. Right. And see what they were doing, though, if they would just stop and listen and listen to Jeremiah and go back and look at the prophets, they would see the real cause for their problems was, is, is, was the result of them worshiping the queen of heaven. Not because, you know, the, the fact that they had it good for so long is just testament to the fact that God is long-suffering. But see, they didn't want to hear that. And, and Jeremiah was trying to tell them, hey, look, this is what's going on. And they just kind of stopped their ears at him. They said, we're not going to listen to what you have to do. We know what's going on. We saw it was good then. It's bad now. So we want to go back to it being good again. And we're just going to worship the queen of heaven. And just kind of turned off their thinking and just, just that's it. And they were judging what they were going to do based on their immediate circumstances. And this is what you need to be able to avoid and, and be aware of. Let's keep reading here in verse number 19. It says, And when we burned incense to the queen of heaven and poured out drink offerings unto her, did we make her cakes to worship her and pour out drink offerings unto her without our men? Then Jeremiah said unto all the people, to the men and to the women, and to all the people which had given him that answer, saying, The incense that ye burned in the cities of Judah and in the streets of Jerusalem, ye and your fathers, your kings and your princes and the people of the land, did not the Lord remember them and came it not into his mind so that the Lord could no longer bear He's been bearing with you all the way up to the point you've been, you've been worshiping the queen of heaven, you've been offering her this incest up until the point to where he couldn't take it any longer. It says the, the, in verse 22, so that the Lord could no longer bear because of the evil of your doings and because of the abominations which you have committed. Therefore, for this reason, is your land a desolation and an astonishment and a curse without an inhabitant as at this day. Because you have burned incense and because you have sinned against the Lord and have not obeyed the voice of the Lord, nor walked in his law, nor in his statutes, nor in his testimonies, therefore this evil is happened unto you as at this day. So here's a people who are, who are believing the exact opposite, right? Jeremiah is saying one thing and they're saying, no, it's the exact opposite thing. He's saying, this judgment came upon you because of the fact that you're serving the queen of heaven, because you're offering up this incense. And they're saying, no, this bad happened because we stopped offering to the queen of heaven and, and all that. So Jeremiah is using scripture. He's using the word of the Lord. He's going to them with the truth, obviously, but he's not relying just on the circumstances. He's able to apply God's word to understand the circumstances, not letting the circumstance just dictate what he does. We need to be founded in God's word to understand, hey, if God says not to offer up any incense unto any other gods, then that's the truth. And when, and when we do against that, of course his judgment's going to come. I mean, that's what makes the most sense. But they, they couldn't see that, and they're just saying, nope, things were good, things were fine, and kind of abusing the long-suffering of the Lord and, and turning it into something that it, that it wasn't. Now, people can get confused these days and judge things unrighteously based on their situations. Maybe they start committing a sin and are kind of unsure about it. Maybe they've heard people say, oh, well, it's not really a sin, and, but they've seen in the Bible or kind of looks like, yeah, you know, it probably is a sin. A good example of this would just be like drinking alcohol, okay? 
The Bible teaches very clearly and very plainly that, that we're not even to look upon the wine when it's red, when it's fermented, when it gives its color in the, in the cup, when it moves itself aright, and you know, drunkenness is a sin, and all this other stuff. But you could hear a lot of people that'll teach and preach say, you know what, actually it's not that bad, it's okay, you can do this. And what people might do, what someone might do is say, yeah, I'm not really sure. And then they do it anyways. And then they say, well, nothing bad happened, right? Oh, I did this. I woke up the next day, went to work, everything's just fine. So they start to think, oh, it must not be that bad. God must not be paying attention. It must not be that bad of a sin because, I mean, I just did this and I'm fine. And you kind of get this false sense of security and false sense of boldness then to be able to do more and say, oh, okay, well, nothing happened. The world didn't end. You know, I hear all this hellfire and damnation preaching and now I do this and everything's just fine. And people will, will judge what they can do and what's right just based on their circumstances. As opposed to just understanding, if you actually read God's word, it's going to say, you know what? God's merciful. He's long-suffering. He wants you to repent. He wants you to get right. But when you sow to the wind, you're going to reap the whirlwind. And this is one of the important concepts just in the sermon tonight is that we need to keep that in mind, the, 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 the truthfulness of sowing and reaping. Because when you sow, you sow seed, you sow something real small. It doesn't grow overnight. We have a garden in our backyard. It didn't, now it's like, you know, flourishing and there's all these leaves and all this stuff all over the place. But that didn't happen. It wasn't like that, you know, the next day after we woke up, after planting the seeds in the garden. You know, you put them in there and all you see is dirt. And you water it and you just see dirt. And then the next day, you just see dirt. And the next day, you just see dirt. And it's like, no. Oh, maybe those seeds aren't even doing anything. You don't see what's going on underneath the surface. And then they barely start to grow, and it's, oh, okay, that's not that big of a deal. Until finally they end up flourishing, right? It takes time. Every time when you sow seeds, it takes time before it's actually going to come up, and you're going to reap from what you have sown before. And we need to remember that when you sin, when you do wickedness, when you do what's wrong, it may take a while. It will take a while. When you sow to the, when you, when you sow to the wind, and you're just sowing to the wind. You know, wind's just a nice little breeze, nice wind. Is when it comes back to you, it's going to come back much stronger. You're going to reap the whirlwind. And that's what happened with the children of Israel here. They started dabbling and, and serving other gods and offering up incense and all this other stuff. And then when it finally came down, it's boom, famine, boom, pestilence, boom. You're getting into captivity and everything just came down hard because they ignored God. Right. And, they, and they, they said, eh, we don't have anything to do with this. And for a long time, things were going great still. Hey, we're offering up incense. We're offering up sacrifices and things are going just fine. We have plenty of food. We don't have any problems. No one's invading us. Everything's going great. We did this for so long and everything's just fine. It's just a testament to the long-suffering of God. It doesn't mean that it's actually okay. You can't make that judgment call just based on what happens immediately. Because oftentimes the result of what you do come down the road. Turn if you would to 2 Timothy chapter 3. Now, I gave you the reference here of people doing, you know, committing a sin and thinking that that's okay because of their circumstances. Well, the, uh, the opposite can also happen where someone maybe does something good, something that's right, something that they're supposed to be doing, but then something bad happens. And then they'll say, oh, well, that just must be a sign for, oh, I guess I shouldn't be doing this. And kind of back off from doing what's right because they're associating some other negative event as being a consequence of them doing what's right. And again, the, the bottom line of this sermon is going to end up being, you know, we need to just trust in God's word and what it actually says for our truth and not, not uh, focusing in on just these external events that happen. We need to be able to interpret events that happen in our life in light of Scripture and not the other way around. Not interpreting the events in our life to define the Bible for us. Look at 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse number 10. The Bible reads, But thou hast fully known my doctrine, manner of life, purpose, faith, long-suffering, charity, patience, persecutions, afflictions, which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, at Lystra, what persecutions I endured. But out of them all the Lord delivered me. Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. 
But evil men and seducers shall wax worse and worse, deceiving and being deceived. But continue thou in the things which thou hast learned and hast been assured of, knowing of whom thou hast learned them. So he's reminding Timothy here, hey, you've known me. You've known my doctrines. You know what I've been teaching. You've known my persecutions. You've known all the battles I've had to deal with. You've known all the things that have happened to me for the cause of Christ. He says, but you just need to keep doing it. You need to keep in, keep doing the things that you've learned and, and remain steadfast, the things you've been assured of, and keep going forward. What happens is oftentimes people get faced with adversity. Christians get faced with adversity. Bad things will start to happen to make you question, am I doing the right thing? Now, oftentimes the reason why people are questioning that so much is because they haven't been taught or they haven't read where the scripture talks about like this verse says in verse 12, Yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. Because the world out there, especially the Christian world out there, is going to tell you that, hey, if you do what's right, all only good things are going to happen to you. God's going to bless you, man. Everything's going to be great. Everyone's going to be looking at your wonderful life and wanting to know, man, how do you do it? That's what's going to happen if you're following Christ, man. He's going to bless you and everything's going to be awesome. That's not what this verse says. Right. Now, will God bless you? Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Amen. But it doesn't mean that you're not going to suffer any persecution. It doesn't mean that your life is just going to be like no problems, no worries. You know, everything's just going real smooth. Because if you're doing what's right... There's going to be persecution that comes your way. And you need to know this in advance so that when it does happen, you're not just automatically thinking, well, I must be doing something wrong then. And, and using that type of a circumstance to dictate, well, I must not do this. I've seen this happen with people out soul winning where you hear the preaching, you see it from the Bible, and you hear it and say, you know what? The Bible says that we need to go out and preach the gospel to every creature. We're going to do it. And then someone, for the very first time, they go out and they end up getting someone who's real angry at the door and they slam the door in their face and stuff. And that scares them off. And they're thinking, well, how could this be? You know, I went out for the first time. How could this happen to me? I, mean, I had this really horrible experience the very first time. I'm not going back out and doing that again. And thinking that somehow what will go on in their head oftentimes is that, well, this must be God telling me this isn't for me. When what's really happening is Satan going, I don't want this person going out here and going soul winning anymore and doing what's right. I want to scare them back off into not doing something for God. You have to remember that it's not always just God telling you different things through your experiences, that there's other influences out there. And many of them aren't good. The satanic influences, how do you know whether that's coming from God or not. How do you know when an event happens in your life that's coming from God unless it just lines up perfectly with Scripture? There's times I could look back in my life where I could see, hey, God had his hand in that. There's, time, there's a time, I, specifically, I remember when my car broke down. I was on my way to work and everything. You know, I was in a kind of a hurry. Man, I need to work a lot this week. I need to get a lot of hours in. And, you know, the car starts going all crazy and wonky and stuff. But I just so happen to be right by this parking lot of a, of a garage, a shop that's right there. I'm able to pull in and, and get to this spot when my car breaks down. And what happens? I walk in. I've told this story before. There's a guy that I've already given, you know, has already heard the gospel from someone at our church. And I recognize him. Hey, he recognizes me. Hey, how's it going? I have all this time now to spend out there leading him and his girlfriend to Christ out in the parking lot while I'm waiting for that. I can look back at that later and say, you know what? God had his hand in that. You know, and the thing with the car ended up not being a big deal at all. They actually had it all done and never came and interrupted me and got me because someone just misplaced the paperwork. You know, it's all these little things that are just, just beyond coincidences that it was just, this is amazing. God had his finger in this. But it wasn't, you know, you could look back on that and say, yeah, that must have been because of look at this great outcome. Because look at, look at everything that happened that, that helped lead them to Christ. But don't take the opposite and say, oh, well, you know, like I was on my way to work and my car broke down. So God must not want me working at that job anymore. <laughs> you know, something like that. It's like, no, you know, it's, you can't look at just the, the random situations and try to make sense out of them because many times there's nothing there. You're going to be reading into things that aren't there at all. We need to make sure that the doctrine is coming directly from Scripture. And we saw here in 2 Timothy, turn if you would to 2 Kings chapter 22. 
In 2 Timothy 3, he's saying, look, if you're going to live godly, persecution's going to come. Don't let the guy slamming the door get you scared. Don't let the, the family members that all of a sudden are going to hear what you believe, if you're coming to this church, and they're going to say, you're in a cult. You got to get out of there. Look, all right, <laughs> I'm not going to ask for a raise of hands, but <laughs> I know firsthand that this has happened. Okay, this has happened with me. It's happened with so many people I know. And we were talking, we were talking about this out soul winning too, uh, Brother Robert and I, because he was talking about how he had just seen this documentary on Jim Jones. Now, anyone who knows the story, that's a cult, okay? And, and people these days throw around that word that it, 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 to the point where it just means nothing. And it really is insulting when someone says, oh, you're in a cult because... Because you change your life a little bit, because you believe the Bible, because you believe, hey, salvation is by grace through faith, and I'm really excited about this, and I want to start doing what's right with my life, and I, and I, and I don't want to be like the rest of the world and just live in this life of misery. I want to just start pleasing God and doing what's right. And yeah, it may sound fanatical to you because I want to tell people about Jesus, but is it really that weird? Is it really that cultish to want to tell people how to be saved? Is it really that weird that we, we look at certain standards of the Bible where, where God cares about, you know, tells us about how women should be dressed, how men should be dressed, how, how men and women should act, and how the man is the husband, you know, is, the husband is the head of the household, and all these basic things. But if you actually believe them and carry them out, you're a lunatic these days and part of a cult. No, the cult of Jim Jones... That is a real cult. Anyone that knows anything about that guy, I mean, the guy threw the Bible out like way early on in his ministry when he had this church he was pretending to be, you know, a Christian church. And he was saying, I'll be God to you. What do you need, Jesus? Oh, you need God? He's like, I'll be that person. When he himself made himself a God man and just had these people, and really what it was, it was just this communist, you know, he was a communist devil. Just, just, he was more political than anything else. And getting these people to follow him, he had them under control. He brought them out to some, you know, some distant land with this communist utopia. And, of course, he was some sodomite reprobate, you know, doing all kinds of wicked things with people in his congregation. That is a cult. And he even told the people that they were going to all have to just kill themselves. And they did it. I mean, that, that's nuts. But to say that, like, because we believe in certain things from the King James Bible, you're a part of a cult. That's insanity. I'm sorry. I mean, that's, that's insulting because that's saying here, you know, the people that come to our church, nobody, I know this for a fact, nobody is just lifting me up on some big, oh, Pastor Burson said this. And, you know, it's like, no. If I told you to drink poison, who, who here is going to drink poison if I said, all right, guys, it's time to kill ourselves. You, <laughs> it's ridiculous. Yeah, right. <laughs> All right, I got one loyal follower. All right. <laughs> Just kidding. It's, it's insanity, you know, and, and people always want to, but, but that'll happen, honestly. When people start to learn about your desire, and they'll, and they'll, they'll kind of see some of your zeal, and they'll see some life changes, and they'll see how you get real serious now about reading the Bible. Say, well, I read the Bible every day. Every day? I've never read the Bible, you know, like, and they'll start thinking that's really weird and then just saying, well, you must be part of a cult then because all of a sudden you are making a lot of changes. You know, churches who are really reaching people, churches who are teaching the truth and people's lives are changing. You know what? That's exciting. Right. That doesn't happen all the time. And for one of the time, oftentimes people just, their first thought just be, well, you must be part of a cult because that's what happens with cult members. Ridiculous. Don't let that worry, you know, because what's going to happen if it's not someone saying something like that, it'll be some other derogatory comment. It'll be something where someone in your family or one of your friends is going gonna, is gonna to try, you know, talking you out of your craziness of, of serving God. Don't let that be, well, is this God talking to me and telling me not to be, you know. No, it's not. If it's what's right, if it's following Scripture, no. Now, if you're in a church, if you're in an area where everything that's being done is contrary to Scripture, well, yeah, then maybe someone is, someone may be trying to, to, to help you out with the Word of God. But the, the point is, is it coming from the Bible or not? Is it coming from Scripture? Is it truthful based off of that? Oftentimes, also, there's other factors involved in, this, in the circumstances surrounding you know, events that happen in our life. Look at 2 Kings chapter 22, verse number 16. 2 Kings 22, verse 16, the Bible reads, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I will bring evil upon this place and upon the inhabitants thereof, 
even all the words of the book which the king of Judah hath read, because they have forsaken me and have burned incense unto other gods that they might provoke me to anger with all the works of their hands. Therefore, my wrath shall be kindled against this place and shall not be quenched. But to the king of Judah, which sent you to inquire of the Lord, thus shall ye say to him, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, is touching the words which thou hast heard, because thine heart was tender, and thou hast humbled thyself before the Lord, when thou heardest what I spake against this place and against the inhabitants thereof, that they should become a desolation and a curse, and hast rent thy clothes and wept before me, I also have heard thee, saith the Lord. Behold, therefore, I will gather thee unto thy fathers, and thou shalt be gathered unto the grave, into the grave, into thy grave in peace, and thine eyes shall not see all the evil which I will bring upon this place. And they brought the king word again. Now, this is with um, Joash. He was one of the last um, godly kings. The last. And um, he was... Um, this happened right before the captivity into Babylon. We were reading in Jeremiah. Of course, Jeremiah spanned most of that time. I'm sorry, I said, I said Joash. I meant to say Josiah. Josiah was the last real godly king. And he followed God with all of his heart. And when he heard the word of God, see what happened is they had forsaken the, they had forsaken the Lord. They had forsaken God. And the word of God wasn't being taught. Josiah found the word of God and he had it preached to him. He's like, wow, hey, look, we found this book in the house of the Lord. And they read it to him and he's like, whoa, wait a minute. You know, we've been doing things wrong for a long time. My ancestors, my fathers have been way wrong on this stuff. And now God's judgment is going to come upon us. When he finally hears what the Bible says, he's like, what in the world is going on? So he wanted to hear from a prophet, and all they could find was this pro hold of the prophetess. And they go and, and, and try to get a word of, from the Lord, from her. And God tells her, he's like, yeah, everything that they read about, guess what? It's going to come to pass because my judgment's going to come. He says, but, but let Josiah know. Let him know that, that because he's humbled himself, because he sought me out and all this other stuff, I'm going to forbear a little bit. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ex extend some mercy unto him so that during his reign, during his time, he's not going to see my wrath come upon the children of Israel because of what he did. He extended the time just a little bit, but he said, you know what? The judgment's still coming. Too much stuff has been done. Too much blood has been shed. And... and it's coming, no matter what. And it was basically because of Manasseh, the predecessor, who had, you know, done all kinds of wickedness, shedding innocent blood, you know, children being, being passed through the fire unto Molech, unto these false gods, and, and all kinds of horrible wickedness was going on. And God said, I, I can't, you know, I can't not bring judgment upon this. So here we have Josiah, though. He hears this. And he says, okay, he continues his reign and does all kinds of great things in service to God. I mean, he's tearing down the high places. He's getting things right that hadn't been right in, in hundreds of years. And getting things right, getting the people right with God. Look at uh, chapter 23, verse number 25 of 2 Kings. Chapter 23, verse 25 says, And like unto him was there no king before him that turned to the Lord with all his heart and with all his soul and with all his might according to all the law of Moses, neither after him arose there any like him. This is a unique individual. Josiah, I mean, wholeheartedly just turned unto God and said, I'm just going to follow him completely and got all kinds of things right. Verse 26, notwithstanding, the Lord turned not from the fierceness of his great wrath wherewith his anger was kindled against Judah because of all the provocations that Manasseh had provoked him withal. So what you can see, and the reason why I'm bringing up this story is that maybe you were someone that was alive during the reign of Josiah, right? And you're thinking, wow, we're doing everything right. I mean, this guy is following God more than anybody else now. Look at this. Right. How could anything bad possibly happen? And then when the destruction comes after Judah is gone, people might say, well, maybe we, should, maybe we were wrong. Maybe, that, maybe what he did wasn't right. And, you know, that's when um, Hezekiah tore down all the, the altars of Baal and stuff. And um, when, when, the, when the king, when... Uh, what was the king's name that was, that was attacking? The king of Syria was attacking. And um, 
he was basically telling the people on the wall and, and the people that went out to met him, and he's like, oh, what, are you going to trust in the Lord? He's like, Hezekiah tore down all your altars to the Lord because they didn't understand that they were, you know, that's, that's not how you worship God at all. And Hezekiah was getting it right, but he's trying to say that, uh, you know, what Hezekiah was doing was, was against, um, against his own God, you know, against the Lord because he didn't understand it whatsoever. We can't look at these events and say, oh, well, because this bad thing happened, maybe all this was wrong. And in, in the case here of Josiah, it, wasn't, it didn't have anything to do with Josiah, God's wrath coming. It had to do with Manasseh. It had to do with his predecessor. It had to do with, with sowing to the wind for so long before him that the whirlwind had to come. The judgment had to come. So you can't look at that event in the present tense you know, if you were alive right at that time and say, well, Josiah must have done things wrong. We should have gone back to the ways of Manasseh because back in the ways of Manasseh, things were going just fine. No, that's why the wickedness came. Well, think about Job, too. Job's a perfect example of what I'm trying to illustrate here. He was the most righteous person alive in his lifetime at that time. The most righteous one in the entire world. He was the most righteous, the most right with God. But look at what happened to him. Look at the attacks that came. Look at, he lost his family. He lost his business. He lost his wealth. He lost everything. Even his wife turned his back on him. Now, you can do what his three friends did and say, well, must be your fault, Job. What did you do? Where's your wickedness? Where's your sin? You know, what did you do? What, you, you, you know, God doesn't just bring this judgment upon people for no reason and have that type of an attitude. But was it Job's fault that all that stuff came upon Job? No. Whose fault was it? Satan's. Satan was the one that was, that was talking to God and saying, oh yeah, you know, you, you, you think he's so great and he has all this integrity. Yeah, we'll see what happens when you take away all this stuff. Oh yeah, see what happens when you touch his flesh and you make him sick. You know, you know, just see all this and, and provoking the Lord. And Satan was still the one that didn't go. God didn't do those things to Job. He allowed Satan to do it, but Satan's the one that came and attacked him. And it wasn't as a result of Job doing anything wrong. So you can't just take your circumstances and say, wow, you know, and Job was well, kind of rightfully saying, well, why is all this stuff happening? You know, he didn't understand it. I'm not saying you're always going to know, but you can't just say all the time that, well, I must have just been doing, you know, I must have just been serving the Lord wrong. Now, it is a good idea to analyze yourself if bad things are happening to you. Am I right with God? You know, am I, am I doing something wrong? But see, the way you determine that is based on Scripture. You look at God's commandments, you look at God's laws and say, am I just in serious sin here? Am I missing something? You know, did I do something wrong and that's why all this stuff is happening? If you're not, if you're, if you're doing generally what's right, I mean, no one's without sin, but if you're, if you're pretty much doing what you're supposed to be doing and you're not involved with some major sin, you can't just assume that, well, what I'm doing just must be wrong. No, you could be getting attacked. There could be a whole bunch of other reasons why things are happening. You can't just judge based on your circumstances you know, what's right and what's wrong. I also, I hate this attitude of the, the meant to be, right? Well, it's meant to be. You, know, you hear people say this all the time. You talk about spouse, well, it just must have been meant to be. And all the other things, it must have been meant to be. It's really like a Calvinistic type of, a, of a understanding of just saying, well, it must be, you know, no. Meant to be is Calvinism's type of predestination. If good things that happen are meant to be, because usually people will say that in a good context, right? Well, it must have been meant to be that we're together, whatever. Well, wouldn't that also then apply for the bad things also? I mean, if, if things are meant to be, do you think it's only good things that are meant to be? Or wouldn't, you know, wouldn't it go both ways? But no one ever wants to say, oh, no, yeah, well, the bad things aren't meant to be. It's just the good things. It's nonsense, and, and so many people fall for it. It's false. But, um, I mean, think about this. You know, man wasn't meant to sin. When God created man, did he want God, what, did he want man to be a sinner? No. And was Adam a sinner at first? No. But he gave man free will and he gave us the choice. So it wasn't meant to be that he sinned, but he still did it. It still happened. Turn, if you would, to Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8 here is a biblical concept, but don't confuse this. This does not support the, well, it was meant to be type of an attitude. Romans chapter 8, verse number 28 reads, 
And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called, and whom he called, them he also justified, and whom he justified, them he also glorified. What shall we then say to these things? If God be for us, who can be against us? And these are great uplifting verses. You know, it, it's, it's awesome to think that, you know, when God foreknew us, when he knew what was going to happen in the future, he predestined us to be conformed to the image of his son. And it says here that we know that all things work together for good to them that love God. Now, that's the end of the thing, right? It's not the middle. It's not the beginning. All things work together for good uh, to them that love God, to them who are called according to his purpose. In the middle, it might not be that good. But see, God's able to make good out of any situation, out of bad situations. Good came, ended up coming out of Job's story, right. right? It wasn't good while he was going through it. It wasn't good when he had boils on his flesh. It wasn't good when he lost his family, when he lost his children. That wasn't good. But you know what? In the end, he was blessed doubly. God gave him even more than what he had had before and, and, and blessed him tremendously after that. And all things ended up working together for good. Because, why? Because Job loved God. And that's an important part that, that often gets missed too. It doesn't mean that all things work together for good for everybody just because you're saved. It says all things work together for good to them that love God. When you love God, Jesus said, if you love me, keep my commandments. That's how you love God is by doing what he, what he, what he wants for you to do and, and obeying him and uh, keeping his commandments. And if you're doing that, then you could say, yeah, well, everything's going to work together for good because I love God and I'm doing what he wants for me to do. So even when seemingly bad things are going on, hey, in the end, there's going to be some good that comes out of this. When, when Stephen was stoned to death and killed, you say, well, where's the good that came out of that? Well, when Saul of Tarsus was standing right there and, and, and hid the clothes of them that actually killed Stephen, later became Paul the Apostle, I'm sure that event of Stephen calling on, you know, looking up to heaven and, uh, and, and calling on God, saying, Lord Jesus, you know, under thee I commend my spirit, that had an impact on Saul, who later became Paul, who did all kinds of wonderful things for God. So there, there are things like that that, hey, it works together for good. In the end, there is a good purpose for this. Why? Because he loved God. But it doesn't just mean that everything is meant to be. Right? Now turn, if you would, to... Last place. We're, we're almost as a short sermon tonight. Turn, if you would, to Exodus chapter 17. Because another thing that people can do, judging based on their circumstances and events that are happening in their life, is they can lose their faith in times of adversity. When you're faced with a problem and faced with, with horrible things happening in your life, a lot of people will lose their faith. A lot of people will question God then and, and, and losing, you know, ultimately losing their faith because of circumstances. This often happens with tragic deaths or things like that. You know, maybe a parent loses a child or someone loses someone really close to them and they say, God, how can you allow this to happen? And they end up, you know, kind of backing off on their, on their faith in God because some horrible thing has happened at that time. And again, that's, that's one is a lack of keeping in mind that verse, hey, if you love God, all things will work together for good. And those are the types of verses that can help get you through those times. But it's also, you know, obviously foolish to be blaming God for when bad things happen too. You know, when, when Satan attacked Job, Job didn't foolishly charge God and, 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 you know, sin with his lips and just say, God did this to me. He didn't do that. He didn't understand what was going on, but he didn't just, just falsely accuse God of something that God didn't do. But look at Exodus chapter 17. It's a similar attitude to the children of Israel that they had after they were delivered and saved out of Egypt and the bondage and the suffering and everything else that was going on in Egypt. God saved them out of there. What happened? Look at verse number one. It says, And all the congregation of the children of Israel journeyed from the wilderness of sin after their journeys according to the commandment of the Lord and pitched in Rephidim, and there was no water for the people to drink. So they had just gotten out of, of, this, of Egypt and they're wandering through wilderness and God's leading them and now they get to a place and there's no water. 
That's adversity. That's, that's a serious problem. What are we going to do? I mean, there's no water. We're going to die here out in the wilderness. Verse number two, wherefore the people did chide with Moses and said, give us water that we may drink. And Moses said unto them, why chide ye with me? Wherefore do ye tempt the Lord? And the people thirsted there for water, and the people murmured against Moses and said, Wherefore is this that thou hast brought us up out of Egypt to kill us and our children and our cattle with thirst? They were being tried and taught to rely on God during this, this time period. And we saw some of that earlier this morning as well. But these people are foolishly, you know, oh, what did God bring us out of Egypt just to kill us here? Like, that makes any sense at all anyways. Why would God do all of his great miracles and, and the great wonders and, and care so much about the children of Israel and not allow the plagues to go on them, but only on the Egyptians? Save them all, that part the Red Sea, do everything just so that you could die of thirst in the wilderness. You know, we can look back at that, that and say, that's just kind of silly. You know, they saw the power of God, but they still doubted in his ability to provide for them. And of course, God does provide for them. You know, Moses hits the rock and there's water gushes out of the flint of the rock and, and, and they're all taken care of and, and they don't die of thirst. But it shows their lack of faith because of some event that happens and them going back then on God. Another uh, illustration that, that happens, and I've seen this happen so many times where people misconstrue circumstances, and unfortunately this happens all too often, I actually run into this more frequently than, than you might think, where we're out soul winning and you end up knocking on somebody's door and you ask them if you know for sure if they're going to heaven. They say, oh yeah, I'm going to heaven. I'm saved. You say, well, why? Well, five years ago, I was in this really bad car accident and God saved me out of that car accident. So I know that I'm saved because, I mean, God didn't allow me to die then. So yeah, I'm saved. And people will look back at situations like that. And, and look, it may sound silly. I've had this happen many times. Many times where people put a false sense of assurance on their own eternal life based on a physical circumstance that happened to them. And I try, you know, I usually try to, to kind of downplay that the experience and say, well, it's great that God saved you because, hey, maybe God did save them physically. Maybe God loves them. He wants, to, he wants them to have a chance today to hear the gospel being preached unto them so that they could get saved. You know, I'm not going to doubt that. Maybe that is what happened. But obviously, they're screwed up thinking that that physical event that happened results in their spiritual salvation. And it happens way too often where people just kind of judge, well, these events have happened to me. Well, every time I get into trouble, God just seems to be there. And they have this, this sense that God is with them, even though their faith isn't in Christ. And it's like, look, man, and you try to show them, Look at what the scripture says. This is what it takes to be saved. This, you know, and, and they don't want to hear that because they're, they're basing truth on their experience instead of on the word of God. Last place I may be turned. Look at 2 Peter chapter 3. 2 Peter chapter 3. Truth is found in scripture. Yea, let God be true, but every man a liar. Amen. Don't let your circumstances dictate what is right and what is wrong and, and what you think you should be doing. Let the scripture determine that for you. Second Peter chapter number three. One other area where people will be, and this is prophecy about what is going to be happening, what people will be saying is people misinterpreting events that happen of Jesus not returning. And so ultimately saying, well, where, where is the God of the Bible? Where is you? you know, things have been going on the same way for a really long time. You know, you're trying to tell me that Jesus is coming back to judge the world. Yeah, right. It's been a couple thousand years already. If, I, if he was coming back, I thought I'd be back by now. And having that type of an attitude of misinterpreting your circumstances in your daily life instead of getting the truth from the Bible. Look at 2 Peter chapter 3, verse number 1. This second epistle, beloved, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance, that ye may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and of the commandment of us, the apostles, of the Lord and Savior. Knowing this first, that there shall come in the last days scoffers, walking after their own lusts and saying, 
Where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. He said, this is what people are going to be saying in the last times. They're going to be scoffing. They're going to be mocking. Yeah, well, where is God? Yeah, I've been hearing about this stuff and, and, and people talking about the coming of Jesus Christ and second coming and the rapture and all this other stuff. Where is it? Where is this promise? It's been so long already. Things just keep on going and continue and keep on keeping on. Where is God? And this is what people are going to be saying. Look at verse number 5. For this they willingly are ignorant of, that by the word of God the heavens were of old, and the earth standing out of the water and in the water, whereby the world that then was being overflowed with water perished. But the heavens and the earth, which are now by the same word, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. But, beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord is a thousand years, and a thousand years is one day. He's trying to remind you, say, it's not that long to God. A thousand years, two thousand years might seem like a really long time to us. Saying to God, it's just like a day. A thousand years pass. It's not that long for God. God's outside of time anyways. I mean, God's eternal. God has always been and always will be. Not a big deal to him. Verse 9, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness. He's, like, he's not just saying some things and not actually going to follow through and do it. He's not some slacker. He's going to do it. It says, but his long suffering to us word, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in the which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are therein shall be burned up. It's the same attribute of God we see over and over again. It's the same attribute of God back in Jeremiah 44 that we started off with in the story that God's long-suffering. God's merciful. God's not willing that any should perish. God wants everybody to be saved and go to heaven. That is the reason why he allows things to continue for as long as they do. That's why he allowed the sin to continue for as long as it did because he has a point. He has a limit. And when it gets to that point, man, watch out. Don't be tempting God. And that's what he's, he's illustrating here. Like he's, God's just, just wanting so many. You know, everyone, just be saved. Get right. Repent. Get ready. But the more and more people just ignore it, refuse, and I don't want to hear it, the angrier and angrier that God gets. And that's the way it's going to be at the second coming of Christ. I mean, it talks about here the, you know, the, the elements melting with fervent heat. I mean, that's the wrath of God being poured out because he's given you every last possible opportunity that he, that he possibly could. And when you just keep rejecting that, <laughs> fine. There's nothing more I can do for you. But, um, you know, let's, let's not let, our, let other things dictate what we believe or what we should be doing just through outside influences. Let the scripture speak for itself. Get what you believe from this book. And, hey, whether good or bad happens as a result of following this book, keep following it. Don't let that determine whether or not you're going to continue in a certain way. Because those circumstances can have all different kinds of reasons behind them or no reason at all. But what you do know and what you can stand firm on is God's word. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for your words, for the great instruction that you've given us, dear Lord. We know that, that we can be unwavering and, and we can be solid on this rock of your word. There's so many things that happen in our lives that, that can be confusing unto us, dear Lord, that we might not understand, that we don't get. We don't know why certain things happen, dear Lord, but help those not to sway us away from your word, dear God. If anything, just, just help those events to uh, fortify our belief and our, and our strength um, coming from your word, but, but not, to, not to damage our faith, not to be... Um, foolishly charging you when things go bad or even just assuming that maybe something is that we're doing is wrong just because um, just because of a negative uh, event that happens dear Lord if we can see clearly that that what we're doing is right from your word dear God please strengthen us and help us to continue doing your work in Jesus name we pray amen